Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. So what we're going to do today is we have a few historic highlights of things that you might have noticed. And then we also wanted to like highlight some of the newer items that you may or may not have seen on the campus across um, the past few years because it's become a very robust program. We have about five new public art um, commissions in the work, so it is a very robust and growing program. Um, especially with the growth of MIT's campus and new buildings, both in Kendall Square and then also on the dorm side with the dormitory um, building. So we're kind of flanking each side of campus um, with a lot of new growth. And then as renovations are happening in mid campus, we're getting some new mid campus things too. So there's always new to see um, and hope to welcome you back on the physical site soon within the next year. Um, and we just restarted doing some of our public art tours on campus. Um, which we haven't been able to do for the last year. But within the meantime, you're going to see a snapshot of what we've also been doing at the List Center for some of our visual um, uh, Zoom call tours and virtual tours. I'm also joined here today with Audrey Gata, who I'm going to hand it over here in a moment. And she's one of our List Center student guides. Um, she's been really working hard on presenting these across the year and um, I'll be running the visual program. Uh, we also have slides and then it'll be augmented some, with some closed captioned videos that we'll share as well. So you can kind of get a, a three-dimensional view. Um, and then either of us are also welcome and able to um, answer some questions in chat if you have anything that you would like to, to share with everyone along the way, or we always love to hear experiences that other alumni have had of the artwork on campus. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to you, Audrey. Thank you so much, Emily. Hi, everyone. I'm Audrey. I'm a sophomore, or I just completed my sophomore year at MIT, and I'm studying course 4B, which is a newer major in the Department of Architecture. So I'm studying art and design. And I'm a tour guide here at the list. So I know many of you might already be very familiar with the list center. But just a recap, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, because as Emily said, I think a lot of times some students, or during their time at MIT, some students know a lot about the list and others have never heard about it. So the List Center is MIT's version of a contemporary art museum, and it explores the foundations and frontiers of the visual arts here at the Institute. It serves as the laboratory for forward thinking and experimentation for the art world. And MIT established the center in 1950. It was originally named the Hayden Gallery to provide a de dedicated structure upon which to build the Institute's existing relationship to the arts. It was renamed the List Visual Arts Center in 1985 in recognition of a gift from Vera and Albert List. And it was relocated to its current location here in MIT building E15, which is the Wiesner building or also the old Media Lab building which was designed by MIT alum I.M. Pei. And in addition to the full slate of gallery exhibits that are presented at the list every year, the list also maintains and adds to MIT's permanent collection, oversees the student lending art program, which allows students to borrow original artworks to hang in their rooms for a year. And the list commissions new work, new works through the MIT Percent for Art program, which I'm definitely gonna go more into later in the tour because many of our tour stops are percent for artworks. And since I know that many of you have spent a considerable amount of time on MIT's campus, I'd love to hear if you remember seeing public art on campus or any if any particular pieces stand out to you. So feel free to share in the chat if you remember certain pieces or any in particular. So today we're going to see six different works. We're going to start, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have both newer works that many of you may not be familiar with because as Emily was describing, the public art collection on campus is growing every single year, especially as new buildings are being built. So we're going to see Against the Run, which is one of the newer ones as well as La Grande Voile, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, Aesop's Fables 2, Northwest Passage, Bars of Color Within Squares, and The End of Signature, which is actually the newest work right now.
So before we get started, I have a couple guiding questions as we look through the works, especially since this tour is virtual and we can't just walk around the works and really experience them in person. It's important to think about how different angles, seasons, and times of the day in the photograph influence our perception of the work and also how the work is integrated into the space it occupies because many of these works are in response to surrounding buildings or the surrounding environment. And finally, how is the work made or installed? Although we'll only be looking at the finished pieces or when we walk around campus, we only see the finished works. It's always interesting to think about the process of art making. And I see a couple of comments here already. So Calder, Henry Moore, a sculpture that looked like an open square. Oh, that's interesting. And the Sean Collier Memorial. So we'll definitely be looking at the Calder. So that one will probably be familiar to a lot of you. But we're actually going to start with Against the Run by Alicia Quade, which is one of MIT's most recent acquisitions of public art. And so this may just look like a clock, but it's unique in that the second hand takes counterclockwise one beat and then returns to the 12 o'clock position as the clock face turns. So it creates a sort of spasmodic mechanical movement that seems to counteract the run of time, but the clock face rotates in order to still tell the right time. So with the second hand going almost against time, Quade here is really emphasizing time as a nonlinear movement as opposed to a fixed measure. Currently, Quade's piece is located in the plaza that's actually right outside of the list center. And the proximity of Quade's clock to the Kendall MIT station, the, the subway station, is very significant because it really echoes the history of clocks and train stations. And its free standing nature in the plaza makes you ponder time as you are walking by. And in the next slide, we're actually gonna watch a short video and hear from the artist herself and see more about her vision and her process in creating this work. I'm super happy that this work and up here on the MIT campus especially because I think it's something which should really be in public and especially on a campus where people are crossing every day and they are checking the time. It's always about the idea behind and so um, this is very connected to all my other works. It's more like a humoristic easy work which I would uh, call it. So it is like you know this clock which is somehow physically trying to escape itself but it's like a Sisyphus trying to push up the stone, but it will never succeed. And it should not look like art on the first moment. It is a found object. The clock is still showing the right time, so it works perfect like um, at the spot where it is right now, because it looks like it would ever have been there for me. You can check the time and you can see it right, but actually most of the people have really struggle to read the time because we are so used to see a clock in a special way and this is behaving somehow different. So what it does, so it's a little sensor in the clock and every time the hand of the second is turning to the right, all of the face of the clock is turning to the left. So what is happening is that it looks like the second arm would always stand on 12 and the clock would actually not move, but the pace of the clock is moving. So if you look at it like from a different, let's say, angle, you would still see the right time. Electric time was founded in the late 1920s. Uh, we've been making tower and street clocks since then, um, almost 100 years now. All of our clocks are custom made to order. So the beauty of a custom clock is that the artist or the client can get whatever they desire and that we're able to make it. We first started working with Alicia Quade through the Public Art Fund in New York City. Uh, we did a project together for Central Park and uh, that clock has since moved to a museum in Shanghai. Alicia has chosen other colors. So we will start out with the initial design. We make recommendations on hands, we'll give her some selections or numbers, we can give her some selections. She has come up with her own designs. We use different styles of post clocks. Each of her projects has been a different style. The color and design 
final decisions are, are made by Alicia. It's communicating both ways, um, what is possible to do and what she would like to see. Um, and we provide drawings to her so she can see what it will look like before we build it. A post clock by definition is a conventional style of clock. The post clocks were originally put into towns by jewelers or by railway stations so that there would be a central point of time in the town or the city. So the whole town would be functioning on the same time. There weren't the proliferation of clocks that we see nowadays. Everybody wears a watch, has a cell phone with the time, the computer has the time on it. Back then it was just that one clock in town um, and it typically was a post clock. So you would have that clock that people would be able to set a pocket watch by or know when the train was arriving. So the, the history of post clocks was the centralization of time, the standardization of time. And now there, this one is being used as, as an art piece. The clock is fabricated in aluminum and most of the clock is, is either spun or fabricated aluminum. The clock movement itself is done in brass and stainless for longevity. We wanna make sure it's around for a good long time. So I always find it really interesting to see more of her design process and design choices over how, her art making process. And so in the intro, I mentioned the Percent for Art project. MIT's Percent for Art program is an initiative that began in 1968, allocating a portion of the budget from each new building project or major renovation to the purchase or commission of art for public space. MIT's is the first percent for art program at a private institution of higher education in the US, and it is also the most active to this day. Quad A's Against the Run is one of the most recently commissioned percent for art projects for the Kendall Square Initiative, and it will be relocated to Kendall Square upon the completion of the building project. If any of you guys have been in the Boston area or the Cambridge area recently, I'm sure you've noticed how the Cambridge skyline has been changing, especially in Kendall Square. So many of those buildings are MIT buildings and this piece is one of the percent for art projects for the Kendall Square initiative. And in my opinion, its relocation will also make its proximity to the train station even more significant as they talked about a little in the video. Audrey, I, I wonder if you have any idea how many of these clocks um, Quad A has made. Um, I didn't realize there wasn't just the one at MIT. And I'm also curious about how people at MIT on campus react to this when they see it. And if you don't know, maybe Emily does. I am personally not entirely sure how many clocks she has made. I don't know if Emily has a better estimate. Um, no, because it's not completely public because a lot of them have been acquired by um, personal collectors that didn't want to be known. So I know that there's like a personal collector in Australia that has bought one. So I think that there's probably about 10, but there's only um, two or three that are considered public um, as far as on view. Um, for others to see that are not in personal collections, but I think she's made about like 10 or 12. Um, and it happens to be when we could visit, we could visit the clockmaker because it's located just south of Boston for that electric time company, but they do make clocks for worldwide um, for city centers. And like um, Brandy had said in the, the video, they've been around for about 100 years. So it was just one of those nice coincidences that it was really like a local place that we can go and visit um, to that use for this. Um, and it is currently located still outside of the E15, but it will be moved this summer um, to the, the Kendall train station once that's kind of completed. So it'll have that kind of history um, and sighting. Um, 
as far as people reacting, I mean, I think some people just walk past it and think it's a normal clock. And then some people, <laughs> once they notice it, you see people like kind of stop and like, you know, look up and like look at their watch or like pull out their, you know, clocks. I mean, there are some people that do pick up on that it is a, a little off. Um, and I think some people, you know, just think it's a clock that's just sitting outside of MIT Medical. <laughs> you know, so I think it is, it's kind of one of those fun reactions. And I think once it starts to become even more present in public in the Kendall um, T-stop area, it'll be really interesting to kind of see how some of those different reactions really play out. Um, with I wonder if we could put a sign with a little explanation about who she is and the fact that there are other clocks and that the time is accurate. You just, and that the, it's the clock that's moving. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we always have like our public art um, plaques, but they are kind of, like you said, buried in the ground and we have the QR codes right now because um, this is right next to MIT Medical where they have the COVID test center where um, everyone that's on campus has to go at least once a week. Um, we did put out these little yard signs to kind of call out some of the public art. So next to um, the three works that are right there by MIT Medical, including the Alicia Quade, we do have these yard signs that are doing this kind of like, did you know, um, facts, um, which have been kind of fun because I've seen some people like stop and then we can have the QR code that links back to our mobile um, public art device um, information. So that's really the best way. But I think it is good to continually to think about like, how do we get people to really notice um, the artwork components of these things? Yeah. Philip. There's another question in, in chat. There are a couple more questions in chat if you're looking at them. Somebody said, which museum in Shanghai? That's where he is. Yeah, I'd have to look that up. So um, I'm going to type my email address in the chat so anybody can follow up with me. And I'm happy to follow up with some of these more detailed questions. But I have to ask my registrar for where the one in Shanghai exactly is. Um, and I don't know what happened to the clock that was at the current T station in Kendall Square. I think that's what Beverly was asking here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I just know that everything is kind of dismantled right now as it's being rebuilt. So I, I'm curious what will come back and maybe it'll, that'll become embedded um, back into the new design of the entryway for Kendall. I'm not sure. Well, having that woman from the electric clock company was really interesting and Audrey's talk comments were too. Thank you. Thanks. All right, well, we'll travel to our next stop on our virtual tour. <laughs> so our next stop is actually one that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, one of the most iconic public art pieces on MIT's campus. It is La Grande Voile, or The Big Sale by Alexander Calder. And it is actually MIT's first major commission of public art, which was before the percent for our pro program was established. Although Calder is often known for his mobile sculptures or sculptures in motion, he also worked on stables or stable sculptures that rest on the ground while still maintaining the light and lifted qualities of his mobiles. The stability of the sculpture is really incredible considering its massive scale, it actually weighs 33 tons and the very few points where it contacts the ground. Together, the flat and curved components create a sense of gestural and dynamic energy. One of the things that I really love about the sculpture is its connection to the green building and the notorious wind tunnel that I know, I know many of you might have experienced during your time on campus. And the, the myth says that the Calder sculpture was placed here in order for the doors of the green building to be able to open in spite of the strong wind. In fact, Calder even created a scale model of the sculpture to test its stability in MIT's Wright Brothers wind tunnel. And in addition to supposedly stopping the winds, Calder sculpture serves as a protector of the time capsule that was buried underneath it during the installation in 1966. And finally, to me, the big sale also connects very strongly with the Charles River 
as it overlooks Charles River and the many sailboats that ride its winds every day. So our next piece is also one that I think some of you might be familiar with. It is Aesop's Fables 2 by Marc de Suvero. So building off of the idea of large and imposing sculptures, here we have Marc de Suvero's Aesop's Fables 2, which is located in Hawkfield Court, right outside of the Stata Center that was designed by Frank Gehry. And de Suvero's abstract sculpture is fabricated from industrial building material, specifically steel plates and I-beams that were assembled on site using plasma cutters, welding torches, and cranes. Going back to the idea of the process of art making, Marc de Suvro really emphasizes this process of fabrication by leaving exposed the bolted joints and the welded areas of his sculpture. Aesop's Fables 2 is con consists of two components that are connected by an I-beam going across. One section, the one on the left in this picture that is closer to us, contains curved steel plates and the other is formed by five interlocking I-beams that create dynamic angles and recalling the gestural compulsions of abstract expressionism. So one of the things I love the most about this sculpture is really just seeing it from different angles or different seasons and times of day and how it looks different what, where based on where you're seeing it from. So often when students are walking through Hawkfield Court, looking at this, when you're looking at the sculpture, different shapes and spaces emerge from the viewing angle and distance. So I'd love to hear in the chat how you're interpreting the sculpture, how you see the different angles and seasons influencing your perspective of this sculpture. Also, another thing that specifically stands out to me is the red and how the red looks so different, whether it's in the sunlight or in the snow or in shadow. But I really love that image of it in the snow where the snow almost erases some of the planes of the sculpture, which is really interesting. So feel free to share any thoughts you have in the chat, but we'll move on to our next work, which is North, the Northwest Passage by Ulfer Eliasson. And this is also one of the newer works on campus. So the title of Ulfer Eliasson's installation, Northwest Passage, refers to the sea route between, or in the Perry Channel between North America and the Arctic, which used to be an impassable route, but is now possible to sail due to global warming and the melting of the ice. The ice caps in this passage are melting because of the expansion of global industry, which in turn allows, allows for more trade along the route, which leads to more climate change and global, the expansion of global industry. And so this creates a vicious cycle. The mirrors, it might be hard to tell in this picture, but in the ceiling of the breezeway, there are a set of mirrors surrounding by, surrounded by LED rings. And the mirrors of a license installation are actually based on the silhouette and configuration of the pattern of free floating ice found in the Northwest Passage. The LED light rings form a sort of optical illusion because depending on which angle you're looking at them, they either form a full circle or a broken circle. And this can kind of symbolize the idea of this being a cycle of climate change. Additionally, 
the reflection of the ground in the mirrors could represent stepping stones as if the land is underwater due to climate change. Or even if you were to walk under this sculpture and look up, we would see our own reflections in the mirrors, which to me hits hints at the complicity of society in the cycle of global warming. So next we'll watch a short video to hear more about the artist's vision in creating this work. One of the great things that culture and art is capable of is actually giving a physical language to something that is otherwise highly mediated or abstract, meaning that something like climate change is very difficult to understand because it's just like I can't touch it, I can't measure it. It's not like a, it's not like a ball in my hand. It was actually for the first time possible to sail the Northwest Passage on the western side of the North Pole, connecting the two oceans and shortening the way of sailing. And it's been long time debated whether this will ever, ever be possible. And now with global warming and the melting of the ice, it suddenly is possible. Um, and in that sense, I thought this is a nice topic I'm interested in and the fact that when you see satellite or pictures of, of the ocean, airplane pictures of, of this particular ocean, you see the ice scattered around and you realize that these white ice sheets, they look like small islands or small pieces of land. And you, when, if you wanted to cross, you would have to jump from one to the other. And um, that had interested me. I'd actually made drawings of that in my studio and I was just interested in the fact that um, a lot of what we know as being stable has become unstable. And a lot of the things that we take for granted as out of the reach of change are in fact now changing. So the world, as we know it, has uh, become a lot more relative. And with regards to the whole sort of idea of nanotechnology, I thought, okay, this is also interesting because in a way, nano is about making what we could not see before visible or making the invisible visible. As an artist, I'm trying to sort out, well, what kind of art or what type of artistic interventions in the world can I do to bring about a more action-driven relationship with the climate or an opportunity for you to see, well, turning your knowledge into action is actually something that is a little easier than I thought it would be. And actually, the climate is not as abstract as I thought it would be. It's right here in front of me. I can touch it and it is understandable. And it's not like big science. It's, a, it's quite specific and, and so on. I think that Art alone should not be the one who communicates the explicified version of what climate challenge is, but it is one of the great things that I think is exciting to work with as an artist is, is to make things which we know explicit as something as we feel, giving it our, you could call it our emotional narrative, uh, besides the sort of data-driven data -driven narrative. The artwork here came out of my interest in, in various other artworks to work with geometry and these more random shapes that you could say these sort of puddles or pools or ice sheets. And I'm actually in this case particularly interested in the fact when you look up, you obviously, you obviously see the reflection of the ground because it's a mirror and you look up and you see on the ground. And, and to that extent, it is actually like a ceiling which, which has these small islands, if you want, of the ground, and I've worked with that a few times, but you could also see them as stepping stones. Should we be in a situation where the South Pole melts and the chances are significant, right? it's not just some crazy idea, it actually is. That probably means that half the water is completely underwater, not just a little, but like literally underwater. And going around on the campus is likely to be jumping from one step into the other. So when I talk about these things, I talk about the kind of way that a space contains not just us, but also our action and our ability to interact and share things. And I think art can be a part of that equation and artistic interventions and amplify what makes the space, the space better. Amplify the fact that we should be open-minded to the extent of understanding that spaces actually have social potential as well. And sometimes you need a language or you need a sort of a, a quality in a space uh, which simply triggers that sort of social or that generous type of activity. Mm -hmm.
So I think Karen mentioned this in the chat that this, and also we saw this in the video, this is definitely an amazing piece to see in person and also to see the building for which it was built, the MIT Nano Building. So Eliason's Northwest Passage is the percent for art commission for building 12, which is MIT Nano, one of the newest buildings on campus or the nanotechnology laboratory. The installation within the ceiling of the breezeway of MIT Nano is significant because as we heard in the video, both Eliason and researchers in, in nanotechnology are making the invisible visible through their work, whether that be for researchers making what is so small that can't be seen or visualizing what is so small can be seen to the human eye or for Eliason communicating an issue that is at such a large scale that we can't physically see it on a daily basis. So by communicating climate change through art, Eliason presents the issue in an explicit and tangible manner, which induces an emotional narrative for the viewer. So our next piece is Solowitz's Bars of Color Within Squares, which is one of his few floor installation. And it was a percent for art project for building 6C, the Green Center for Physics. So this was built inside what used to be a small courtyard that was converted into an atrium when building 6C was built in the center between these three surrounding buildings. And Solway was originally, or he was originally intended to design something for the walls of the space. But when he visited this, the atrium, he was actually more interested in doing something with the floors. The atrium is just off of the infinite corridor and it forms a secret garden of color and light. And it's actually a place that some students know about and love to visit and others have never seen during their time as, at MIT, which is definitely really interesting. The work covers the entire floor around 5,500 square feet and it consists of 15 18 foot squares of brightly colored geometric patterns that are set off by bands of white and gray. The geometric configuration inside each square uses only four of the six primary and secondary colors, and the two missing colors are designed for the interior bands of the frame. So in the one on the right closest to us, we see that for the actual geometric pattern, he uses purple, blue, green, and orange. And so the two remaining colors, red and yellow, form the interior band of the pattern. And seen from above, like from this view we see here, the geometric pattern shifts ambiguously from flatness to the perception of depth, which was actually just chance construction from the design and not premeditated by the artist. And I see a question um, in the chat, is it painted on the floor or incorporated into the flooring material? So this was actually carried out in glass and epoxy ter terrazzo and was poured into place. So Bars of Color Within Squares is actually one of Solowitz's last public art pieces. He received the commission to do this piece in April 2005, but actual work on the floor began in late May 2007, which unfortunately was just shortly after Lewitt passed away in early April 2007 at the age of 78. So you might ask how this piece was able to be constructed after his death. And it's interesting because Lewitt was often referred to as the founding father of conceptual art, which means that he actually wrote instructions detailing how to create his pieces, but he left the actual installation to others. So as an artist, he personally emphasizes, he personally emphasized conceiving the work rather than implementing it 
and he allowed assistants to fabricate his work based off of his preset systems of rules, which is why he was often actually surprised by the results and they were not ne necessarily intended. Like for example, for this one, the illusion of death was not something that he had originally intended for this design. It was more of a chance construction when the design was actually executed. And one thing I wanted to add, this is a very interesting moment um, and one of the kind of shifts of like how artists um, kind of worked um, at, um, on MIT's campus and being very responsive to the site that they were kind of um, allocated. And so Solowit kind of came in, as Audrey had said, um, there's an anticipation that he would do the walls because he's really well known for his wall drawings and took over the floor. but. Um, this really innovative feat of the colored terrazzo tile. Um, up until this point, terrazzo tile was very neutral colored um, and it was really pushing the boundaries of the material sciences. Um, and this kind of uh, sur is surrounded by the material sciences and engineering department. And so kind of seeing this new material science like engineering put into in place at this moment when you could really like have this really rich colored um, poured resin into the and the evenness of this color is pretty like amazing as well. Like you don't have spottiness, it's pretty solid, um, really rich colors if you see it on site. And so that kind of exemplifies and is in response to like kind of that field of study on the exterior. Um, and then for those that really like love art and this, there's this turn of the art in the 1960s and Solowit is one of the people that could be kind of named the the founder of conceptual art, which was a, a big shift in the art world of kind of shifting away from the idea that aesthetics is the number one driver. Um, it is really the work of an artist is really in the conception and in the mind. And the that is really the true work of the artist. And so there's this big shift um, in how artists kind of worked and conceived and thought of their work and the value of their work as far as the, the thinking process to um, design and execute or conceptualize what they were going to enact. Um, and so having that kind of also surround with the the new building that kind of came with this percent for art, which is the interior where the capped atrium kind of came that you see in the center there is, you know, the theoretical physics department. And so having like kind of these very theory based disciplines working together. And so that's what we kind of see um, in the last 20 years of how artists have responded to the site, it's also about responding to the audience and the occupants of that space. Um, and, you know, there was a little bit of notation there when Audrey was talking about Olafur Eliasson and, and the nano building. It's, you know, and Olafur had kind of pointed that out too. It's like this things that you don't see and making visible what's invisible. And so I do think that there's artists that are really inspired um, by the activities of the, the, the students um, and the researchers that they are there um, and how to kind of push both of their practices in one way. Emily, can I point out that MIT, besides bringing more art to campus, has also been bringing more artists to campus. It has an art scholars pro program. Um, Yana Park pointed out in chat that some of them have come through the McDermott Awards Program, the CAMIT, the Council for the Arts Sponsors, but um, every other year, and Olafur Eliasson was one of them. But there are also art artists who come every year um, and work with students and with professors, and it really has enriched both the artists and the students and the professors. So that's a real change too. Yeah, I love that you said that and maybe you can help me out here. So, um, you know, the establishment of the, the public art, you know, percent for art kind of came in the 60s. There are some earlier purchases of art, but the big commission of the Calder like was like one of these big impetuses of the, the percent for art program where it's like really written into um, MIT's culture of of the purchasing of new artwork in the 60s, you also had the student lending art program established for students to have, you know, original works of art in their um, spaces. And then it wasn't until like the 80s that the List Center was born, and that kind of became stewards of this collection. And you had some art professionals there to kind of work with artists to do this. And then, you know, this is where I think that you can kind of help me out with 
Karen, I know that then cast um, and Cam at like the Center for Art, Science and Technology, um, kind of they're the ones that are also like really overseeing what you were just talking about is the, the integration of artists really working with faculty on this like kind of long term research um, and learning basis and bringing that in together. And then like you said, the, um, the McDermott, which was also said earlier in the chat, you know, with Olafur Elias and like that established the relationship with MIT and the artists and, you know, it was kind of this seed to perpetuate um, kind of a long term relationship with this uh, major artist to kind of really work with the, the community um, in a little bit different ways in a longer way. But do you know when the um, Center for Art, Science and Technology was kind of? Um, I'd say in the last decade or so, Leela Kinney has yeah. really been the person who's most active, um, along with Evan Zaporin, the faculty member. Um, and uh, we can also, I noticed we've got 82 people on, on this call. If, if they want to get more involved as alumni, um, they can get involved with the list in different ways as friends of the list or with the Council for the Arts at MIT. So um, that would, you know, it doesn't have to be a once a year. <laughs> Yes, I know no, this is this is just a primer. <laughs> so um, well, they can so, reach I mean, out to is, you or, or this is um, Kiana, and just wanted to clarify that really, I, I think the the arts at MIT was um, started um, really by Jerome Wiesner, who was our president in the seventies, but you know clearly was influential. He he was passionate about modern art and. I had been on the Museum of Modern Art board. He was JFK science advisor in the early 60s. And, um, and so it's, you know, a lot of things were started in the 60s. And then I think when he was more actively a leader at MIT um, in the 70s, it grew. And before the list, um, MIT had the Hayden Gallery, which I, I was at MIT from 1979 to 85 and worked at the Hayden Gallery. And when I go to the Museum of Modern Art, most of the artists that came through the Hayden Gallery, which is the Huntington Room now, right outside of the Science Library, um, those artists are, you know, in the Museum of Modern Art now. They weren't, you know, they were kind of burgeoning artists back then. So. So the, the arts activities at MIT kind of were continued and then the list came out of the media lab creation and, and became a much stronger presence at MIT. So they closed the Hayden and became the list. So Yana is president or chair, I forget, of the Council for the Arts at MIT. I'm active with it and with the list. So, um, we do invite anyone else who's interested. And that's how I know Emily and uh, all her work, so. Well, yeah, I thank both of you for, yeah, jumping in and sharing some of that. I mean, I'm really, um, and I think this is some, you know, like I said, some people at MIT are not aware of the breadth of arts there on campus. I mean, this, like, you know, like you both were saying, is museum quality work that is really like there and accessible um, in your living spaces, in your working spaces, in your study spaces, um, that's there. And, you know, I think the, the biggest question is always like, why is there such a great art collection here at MIT when it's not an art school? I mean, you had the Center for Advanced Visual Studies also established by Otto Pina and, you know, Gregory Kepish, these, these major um, abstract, you know, conceptual pushing the boundaries of art at the time. And they were kind of in this laboratory of one of these early things in the 60s as well. And it is really about like what MIT's essence and ethos is about. It's about creativity. It's about pushing the boundaries. It's about being innovative and being around all this creative energy really helps like kind of have that environment um, to really match the, the personalities and the, the people that occupy it. Um, and I know I wanted to be able to like show you one more artwork piece and then I'd love and welcome some more chats, but we wanted to show you kind of what is incomplete in the process. 
Absolutely. Before I present this work, I just want to thank you all so much for your comments. And of course, as a student currently at MIT, who, who's been interested in the arts even before coming here, it's been so amazing to have all these opportunities and these experiences. And it's definitely really impacted my time at MIT to be able to have all these opportunities in the arts. So the last work that we're going to look at is Agnieszka Carant's The End of Signature, which is one of the most recent commissions of public art at MIT as a part of the Kendall Square Initiative. So as we saw with the, our first work, The Clock, and it was actually very recent, or it's actually incomplete because it's going to be two pieces, but one of them was recently installed just this past semester. So the end of signature consists of two different collective signatures that are large scale animated LED sculptures that will sign the facades of two new buildings in Kendall Square over and over again. Here, Courant is exploring a new method of visualizing our collective identities in the same way that our own personal signatures are a unique aspect of each of us and our identities, this collective signature can be seen as a visual reflection or a definition of the MIT community. So the communal signature was actually made up of hundreds of signatures from the MIT com community, which Emily collected back in 2019. And the final signature is determined through an AI-led aggregation of those hundreds of collected signatures, which were created in collaboration with researchers from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or CSAIL, located in the Stata Center. And if you're wondering how one signature can come from so many, the video on the next slide will show a little short clip that was put together by MIT CSAIL researchers to demonstrate the process. And then here on the left is actually the first one of these two signatures that was just installed, I think, in early April. And it was installed on one of the newest buildings on campus, which is currently called Site 4, the Graduate Towers at Site 4, which is the newest graduate residence here at MIT. And what's also interesting is that the signature, which you could probably tell here, but this image doesn't really fully capture the building. It was installed beneath the cantilever of the building. So it's kind of interesting because as you're walking in, there's this light em emanating from above. So it really encourages you to look up and see what's there and maybe try to make out what it says, although it doesn't particularly say anything in particular, but it is a collective representation of the MIT community. So to close off, we in, throughout this past hour, we saw many different types of works, some that were freestanding, like the Calder or Mark D. Suvro sculpture, or some that were fully embedded within the architecture, like a license installation or the floor of the atrium. And whether the work is freestanding or embedded in the architecture, its interaction with the surrounding environment is purposeful and unique, especially how we saw with the Percent for Art program and how many of these pieces were actually commissioned for the space that they occupy. Also, we saw some videos from artists themselves and heard a little bit more about the process of art making and the installation of the work and how that also has an impact on the overall interpretation of the work. And finally, even though this tour could not be in person today, based on the different photographs and different views of these pieces, we saw how the materiality of the object or the sculpture, the angle that we're looking at it at, or even the seasons, the times of day, the weather that it was photographed in influences our perception of the work.
So I think we have a couple minutes here. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or unmute yourselves. And also if you're ever curious to see more of the works on MIT's campus, a great place to start is the LIST website, which is listart.mit.edu. And we hope that soon you'll be able to come back and walk around campus and experience all these new works as well in person. And I just want to say I've got a couple private messages of people asking for the, the Olafur video. It's hard for me to get the <laughs> um, link when I'm screen sharing, but if yes, if you visit the Listart website, if you go to public art, um, all of the recent um, artworks that we have, we've been doing the video interviews for. That was a, a shift that we kind of done the last four years, four or five years. So um, we do have videos of those works. And prior to that, we had like, an audio tour. So we are continuing to like kind of build the resources for that. Um, and also in the last couple of years, we finally completed like a completion of um, photographs for the student lending art program. And so there's a portal off our website if you go to the collections. Um, and want to view some of the student lending art programs, either revisit what some of you may have had, because I know a couple of people said that they participated, or those that might have missed out on the program or were interested to see maybe how the collection has grown. Um, but there's over actually 650 works now um, in that collection. Um, and fortunately, this, this last year was the only year that we haven't been able to do it. We just extended some artwork to um, students for two years. Um, for those that were staying around. Um, so we're excited to get back into that um, this upcoming year too. Oh, thank you, Audrey. <laughs> um, so yes, but like I said, we do some of the videos and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff on the public art um, that you can hopefully find on campus. But thank you all so much for joining us today. And I think um, there's another program later today of an, an alumni that was like gonna discuss like kind of their um, decision for coming to MIT was really inspired by the public art on campus. And I know that there was a woman here that said the same thing when they visited campus. So I think that's really great to see that it is a big draw for some students to kind of come to campus. And thank you so much. Thank you all so much. And thank you so much, um, Emily and Audrey, for guiding us on this public art tour. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending this event. Um, please make sure to take advantage of all the other events during um, reunion weekend. And we do still have a few minutes in case there were any questions, um, either in the chat or if um, you'd like to ask them. But thank you so much, everyone. I think there was one question about the reclining figure. Um, and Nancy has always wondered why, if, if there was any significance to its location in Killian Court and why it was placed there. Sure, it was like why it was placed there. I just know that that was something that they were trying to cite two different types of modernist sculpture on either side to have that kind of equal weight when they were thinking about it. Um, and they already had a relationship with Henry Moore and he's kind of a well-known artist, but I'm not quite sure like why that one in particular was chosen. They always have um, different committees that decide for each different um, artwork that kind of comes to fruition there. So the people that are in the decision-making role change all the time, but they always do have a committee of like 20 something um, individuals for those that kind of oversee or stakeholders in the space. There's a piece by Beverly Pepper, in fact, that there's, that's being moved from a little site next to 26100 where it's very hard to see to the front lawn of McCormick Hall. And I'm thrilled that it will be more viewable. She's, she's a New York artist and she had her works along the High Line in New York City. And uh, I like the piece and uh, I think I'm waiting to see it in its new spot. So I don't know who made that decision, but I'm very happy. Yeah, one of our previous um, public art curators um, instigated that because Beverly Pepper is like you said, you know, she's a major you um, major artist, major female artist, 
practicing in sculpture really kind of paved the way for large scale sculpture and quartine steel. And that's um, was kind of a little hidden um, where it was located in this courtyard. Um, and so we're aerating the lawn this week <laughs> to get ready for the move. So it'll be moving soon. Um, like you said to the McCormick and have it just a little bit more visible of space um, and it'll get cleaned. Um, we always do like the conservation, um, usually during the summer months when it's a little bit nicer, we can get out there and, and polish all the bronzes and um, do some repainting. And then in this case, moving some things around to a more prominent location. So I think that'll be good. Mm -hmm. Where is, there used to be a Picasso sculpture in front of the, um, the library by Sloan where is that now? So Sloan's in charge of kind of moving around their own collection. It is in this, um, it's on the newer, like the one of their newer buildings, the E52, not the tank. And um, so it moved over and there's a small courtyard um, in their space, like off of the, the lobby. So it's kind of internal courtyard that it is around. Um, so there's a seating space out there. And so they have the, the Picasso kind of there in a garden um, for those that can have outdoor lunches. So it's off by the cafeteria side over there. <laughs> Great question. And thank you everyone again for attending this event. And um, thank you once more to Emily and Audrey um, for guiding us on this public art tour. And again, um, just please make sure to take advantage of all the other events during reunion weekend. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.